Hi, welcome to another All Hands on Deck. I'm Catherine McBean and today I'm joined again, happily, by my friend, the bowler hat farmer, Mark Byford. We'll be going over to Mark in a moment, but today what we want to do is talk about food hubs. Um, one of the key, key things that PFFA is supporting and very excited about is going to be the introduction of food hubs at community level. Now, a lot of people ask, well, what is a food hub? What, what, what can that do? To be honest, it's really down to the community to decide what they need. So what we want to show today is how you can start with something really, really small. It doesn't have to be difficult, complex, costly, time consuming, something that takes all your energy for a long periods of time to set up. But also and equally, you can have something bigger. So there will be groups out there and communities out there. I mean, no doubt we'll go and find maybe an old industrial unit or something similar um, that they can use as maybe a retail outlet. Maybe it's where farmers and producers drop off product, which can be put together to, to fulfill orders. Maybe you set up an ordering system on the Open Food Network. Maybe it's a hub where the pharmacy cooperative use you as a space to drop off boxes for people to collect food boxes. Maybe it's somewhere that farmers can come together for meetings and other producers uh, to work with the local community to discuss what output they're going to need for the following harvest, for the following season. Uh, it could be somebody somewhere where people bring together produce and then be delivered out to the local food bank. Or if there's not one local to you, could it act as a food bank type of scenario? What you do and use your food hub for is down to each community to decide. But the bottom line is it is there to support not only farmers and producers, but also consumers. And the whole journey that goes from that production through to that distribution and consumption at the end and what happens in the middle. Maybe it's somewhere you hold meetings to discuss how you're going to go and see the local council to open up a local abattoir. Maybe it's used as a uh, part of it's used as education for educational workshops or courses to be run. What that becomes is really down to you. But it's so easy to get the most simple, basic form of a food hub operating at minimum cost and time and energy. As we'll move across to Mark in a moment and he'll explain what he's been doing um, at his local community level and how quickly they were able to get their first food hub off the ground. Um, but the the point I think everyone needs to take from this is start now, do something. It doesn't, don't look at this as having to be a massive project unless you're ready for that to be a massive project. Understand that you can start with something and grow from there. You don't have to have the full shebang rock and rolling straight away. It's really important people understand that. At the moment, we're asking everyone to put one foot in front of the other. Whatever that may look like at community level, whoever many, however many people you've got, what resources you've got, what uh, kind of relationship you have with your council or farmers or producers. Maybe it's a place that you literally rent a couple of times a week and you bring farmers and producers there or other people in the community to discuss how you move forward together. But we wanted to just sort of encourage people to make a start, whatever that might look like, make a start. And then as time goes, you can grow from there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring my lovely Mark in. And Mark's been working away in the background, getting his own first little food hub off the ground. And he's going to take us through how they thought of that, what they did to create that, what was the rough costs of that, how have they got it functioning, and what have the first couple of weeks been like? So, Mark, do tell us about your food hub. Catherine, good afternoon, darling. <laughs> um, okay, so the food hub came about the village where I farm now. Um, in Lorgel. Um I've got some land on the farm here to grow some veggies on. And we were looking at how we were going to sell the produce. And I've been working alongside, obviously, yourself and other people are looking at the food hubs, the Open Food Network, and how that might work for people. And wanted to just get on with it. I'm a get on with it person like yourself, Catherine. And what I really wanted to achieve was you know, I've seen loads of people talking about food hubs, but not very many people doing it. And that frustrates me because I'm a doer. So Ray, whose farm I'm on, said, well, we've got a, a trailer. Uh, this was a big bale trailer that drops down flush to the ground. And he said we could build a shed on it. So they built this shed. And inside is about 15, I think it's about 14 foot by six and a half, seven foot inside. And we've put a shop in it. Now, the relevance to the shop is that inside the village we're in, there is no shop. 
the surrounding villages around that has no shops. And I think I'm right in saying the villages that surround that have no shops. So you have to go three, four villages out before you hit another village shop. So if you wanted a pint of milk, as one lady said to me, it was an eight mile trip there and an eight mile trip back for a pint of milk. So we set up this little shop, put a fridge in it, chucked some tables in. It's very basic. And we'll obviously show the pictures of that later. Um, it's very basic, I have to say. Does it work? Absolutely. It's taking um, most days around about £100. It is heavily guarded by the community. And I, and I say heavily guarded because, you know, we've only got a trust box in there. Um, there's no staff running it. It's just we put the veggies in and, you know, the little bit of dairy in the fridge and loaves of bread and things. And to give you an idea, Catherine, the most expensive thing we have in there is three pounds which is the fruit juice, £2.50 for a loaf of bread, nice bread, proper bread. Um, none of this Tesco sort of nasty Hovis stuff. Um, and as a result of that, you know, you're you're talking uh, probably about to take £100, you've got to sell 60 to 70 items probably. So it's quite busy. And the, what's come about with that, I had a phone call the other day, I was out and about and I had a phone call from a gentleman, he said, is that Mark who runs the shop? I said, speaking. He said, um, it's Jerry. You don't know me. He said, but he said, I live in the village. I've just been down to buy some stuff. And I'm a bit concerned. There's 40 pound in there in notes. He said, what do you want me to do with them? I said, hide them up. <laughs> but I thought how lovely that was that the community were worried about the money. Yeah. Now, the reason I said to him, I said, oh, why are you so worried about the money? He said, we had a village shop and we didn't support it. We all used to go to Tesco's, he said, and we've all realised what a disaster that has been. He said, so we want to make sure no matter what happens, this is a community shop. This is, you know, I, and I said to him, I said, well, that's how I said, I don't see this as my shop or, you know, because it's registered with inside a CIC, which I volunteer for. So the, the big thing with that is it, it's a way for the um, community interest company to raise funds. Uh, they, they're doing the growing on the, um, the veg beds as well. So that will bring the produce into the shop to sell to the village people, not the village people, but, you know, village <laughs> people with a pitchfork um, rather than, a, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so, but I thought that was lovely because it, it's the community yeah. not only supporting it, but being protective over it to make sure nobody else steals anything or, you know, or takes the money or anything. So I thought that was really key because for me, that's, you know how do you police anything you know yeah you can put cameras up you can put security boxes in there and everything else but if someone wants to steal they will because it's in their nature um i'm a great believer in don't deal with it karma will but you know um we can't live in the kind of community where you know people will grab a pitchfork and go and deal with people if you're not careful so um so yeah i think in total it costs somewhere around about a thousand pounds to yeah. kick it off um obviously we had the trailer on the farm so that was handy um I'm obviously in the fruit and veg wholesale trade, so I've got lots of contacts. I spoke to different farmers and got farmers to supply the basics in. Um, the cucumber farm um, were only too happy when I spoke to them, and they gave me baby cucumbers as well, which are only about this long, which is something different. Um, I got um, sacks of potatoes in there, carrots from a local carrot farmer, so yeah, there's all sorts in there. We've got um, a local baker producing bread for us. Amazing. And I was a bit, I was a bit concerned about bread because obviously, you know, bread does go off quite quickly. This stuff's lovely. Um, after five days, it's still nice and fresh. I have to say, we've been selling about twenty loaves of bread a week in there, which you know, I think is quite good for a, for a small village. I have to say, um, people are picking up the milk and the butter. And certainly the fruit and veg is flying off the shelves. And that's the one thing which I was pleased about because, and it, it isn't all organic. I will say that's something we're working towards as we grow more and more on the farm itself, then that'll all be um, chemical free and organic. Um, but yeah, I think the big thing, Catherine is like you said earlier, it, it's what people want it to be. Whatever the community wants it to be, it can be. There's no set blueprint to this. You know, I know we've been working on a blueprint towards people launching hubs. And the thing is that you can, be in a position that you can write the best business plan in the world and it's completely out the window if no one takes any notice of it. The quickest way to do that is say, look, here's a load of suggestions. So, for instance, I see the hub long term 
as we start it with a shop, we could progress that to a um, collection point for veg boxes as well. And the next step on for that is to open it as a full hub where everything transfers through. Now, one of the things I've seen locally is that um, in the shops I've had, we've got a, a, a whiteboard on the wall and, you know, people can leave messages for us. And nice we, touch. That's a really nice touch. Well, you know, it's, it, we're gonna, it, it simply says, tell us what you want. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Perfect. Yeah. So people said tea bags or, you know, digestives, whatever it might be, and then we can get that in. <coughs> but I think the, the, the thing that's come out of it is that the where we are in East Anglia, there's very few farms now because they're all arable farms and they're all huge. So they're either growing some kind of grain, sugar beet, potatoes. That's really where we live. Um, however, what I've seen in the past year is certainly my cousin Mike, who's taken over a place called Jubilee Farm just outside Berry Snemmons. We've obviously set up here now. There's another couple of places I know um, in the area which are setting up as small independent farms. And I've spoken to all of them and they're all like, what do you need us to grow? Yeah. So we'll grow Brilliant. whatever you want. So what I've done, because I'm also obviously um, long working with yourselves, I'm also a coordinator of the Land Workers Alliance. So we've got 250 members for them across East Anglia. And I spoke to one of them the other day uh, up at Berry Farm up near Beckles. And again, they're a, a great little growers, chemical free growers. And they have loads of extra stuff, what they grow. They run a veg box scheme, not a shop. So they run a veg box scheme. So they have particular stuff they need to hit each week to make a box full. So they've always got overs. So for the shop, all I'm doing is when I'm up that way, um, picking up stuff from other farms, is I pick up all of their overs. Their overs Amazing. come back here. They get sold in the shop. They get no waste. They get some extra cash. We get some really nice quality stock. We turn Absolutely. it into money. And the system works. And that's as difficult as it needs to be. And I think, unfortunately, we've been led to believe the food supply chain is very difficult. Um, yeah, you know. Um, and when it fell on its ass last time, Catherine, I don't think it fell over at all. I think it was pushed. I think that it was done deliberately to see how we as hu the human race dealt with that situation, interacted with that situation. Um, and I think that that was just a play to see how we dealt with it. Yeah. I think what came out of that was it woke some people up. I mean, certainly people like ourselves who were growing at the time and had retail outlets um, on the food side. To give me an idea, Catherine, I, was, I, I always smile about this because we had a we had a farm shop inside a polytunnel. Amazing. And our farm shop took a, about a hundred pound a day. Okay. Right. And we did ten vegetable boxes per week as a, an absolute maximum. And the guy with the scruffy hair who reckoned he was in charge of the country um, came on TV and said that, you know, we've got put, put your mask on and cover yourself up and it, it's terrible. Everyone's going to die. And, oh, I didn't, but uh, I didn't die either. Just just checking, but I didn't die either. <laughs> or put a mask on. Um, but the thing what happened was that we went from £100 a day to £15,000 worth of sales a day. And wow. we went from 10 veg boxes a week to 400 a day. So wow. that gives you an idea. <laughs> now, we coped with that escalation, but yeah. supermarkets couldn't yeah. because it take the supply chain's too long-winded. For me, I needed, you know, <laughs> Kier, who's the farmer who's supplying my potatoes, was, Kier, I've run out of potatoes. He says, yeah, all right, do you want another lorry load dropped off? Two hours later, an tick pulls in, the potatoes there, we're putting them in people's cars. Thank you very much. It's ten pound, and that's yeah. how quick we could react to things. You know, uh, ex partner and I, we were getting in a van at eight o'clock at night, driving to Lower Stoft, filling the van full of stock which the farmers had gathered up for us, and that day from three or four farms which got it all together for us to save us messing about. We were coming back. There was a team of people at the farm unloading, and that was how quick we could adapt to it. Within literally forty-eight hours, we've got everything spinning. They can't do that. Yeah. What I would say on that is that next time, I believe, because there will be a next time when you're told to cover up and 
get your jibby jab. Um, I think next time they'll play the game very differently because what happened um, during the pandemic, Catherine, was the wholesale fruit and veg was still in abundance. Lorries were still rolling in from Holland and Spain and there was no issues on food coming into the UK. We're in a very different position now. Very different yeah. position. The food what's in the system is a lot, lot, lot less. The farmers, obviously, this year, during the pandemic, we would, we could draw on hundreds of tonnes of produce in a day. That stuff isn't there anymore. The carrot farmers, I, I think I was talking to you yesterday about this, the carrot farms closed down till September because they can't get the tractors on to get the carrots what are in the ground off. They can't get on to drill the new seed what needs to go in. Yeah. So there is no carrots. Tater farmers, onion farmers, all the same. Um, I went out the other day. There's fields sitting underwater. So we're going to have food shortages at the end of this year. And there won't be the stuff in the system to fill the void like there was last time. That's why the supermarket's pulling so much stuff from overseas. Yeah. Now, what I do see is a lot of small growers will pop up over the next one to five years. Yeah. And I, I see that personally as bigger farmers that maybe have um, a patch of land what sits fallow for whatever reason, because a lot of farmers have an acre of land on the farm what's always covered in bloody scrap tools and everything else. Um, and if they wanted to, they could clear that for the community. And I think that's what will happen. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And I think we'll see in five years' time when a lot of these set-aside programmes and um, under the Elms policy come out of set-aside, that you'll see a lot of that land then go down to vegetable growing and food production rather than, you know, um, going back into uh, wildflowers and, you know, grass and so forth. So I think we're going to see a very different world, Catherine, um, that you and I will both be pleased with, I have to say. I think yeah. that we will be pushing um, hard. I know from the PFFA point of view, I've spoken to several YouTubers that are now getting onto the same platform as us to um, be in a position of actually pushing the public. Because th this is one of the things, Catherine, which, which I have been talking about in the last few videos, is this stuff is really, really important. And we give it away too easily. Yeah. This stuff is what keeps the system afloat. And if you go to the likes of a supermarket or you've got Sky Television or you've got, you know, whatever it might be um, that your money gets sucked up by, by the octopus with all the tentacles going, I'll have some of like that. Um, I think what we need to, to get to is cut them off at the knees. Yeah. Stop going. Stop giving them your money. I've cut down through through work and my own home use. I've cut two and a half thousand pound a month out of Tesco's pocket. And I say Tesco's because that's who I shopped with. Um, and that's who I used to get fuel for work from. We have two vehicles on the road every day, six days a week. And I think it, uh, we would spend in 300 pound a week, probably, you know, on fuel. Um, We've stopped it. We're now going to an independent petrol station. We know the guys, the uh, Indian yeah. family what run it are lovely. We go in there, we have a laugh with them. They say, you know, and they're five pence cheaper than Tesco's with fuel. Right. Right. And um, he said, it's all about volume. If I can build more volume, I can get the price down. I said, okay, how many more people do I need to bring here? And that is where the community have got yeah. to realize that they hold the key. This stuff is what keeps the system afloat. If you don't spend it with them, they haven't got a system. It's as simple as that. The shareholders will soon bail out on the likes of supermarkets if their share values drop. Quickest way to drop their share value is stop giving them your cash. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what I think is lovely is you picked on the fact of what a difference community can make if you all just support each other. It doesn't need to be complex. It doesn't need to be difficult. It doesn't need to be costly and time consuming to start making small changes. Even, you know, you said you've got that, you know, admittedly at a trailer base, but you, you've got your shop up and running for about a thousand pounds. Yeah. Now I'm pretty sure if a community of people come together, those that are interested in, in it and everyone stuck 20 quid in or 20, whatever into the pot, you're soon going to pull together that sort of money in order to get a basic 
situation operating and off the ground. Yeah. And I think it's important because of the time frame we're up against that people adopt this mentality sooner rather than later, i.e. Absolutely. You don't have to have all the big singing and dancing operation. You don't need to do that. Start small and go from there. I mean, I was speaking um, with Nick at Open Food Network, and he was saying one of their hubs is actually a pub. And out yeah, back, yeah. they've got a room. And once a week, they get the delivery of all the goods that come in from the various producers and suppliers. A couple of volunteers sit there and box it all up. And then from a certain time, the buyers, the consumers know they can come and pick up their box jobs are good and yeah and it's as simple as that to get rolling with the help of the open food network in order to coordinate it but you can just as easily do it on a whatsapp group if it's a small community group you can just as easily do it that way <laughs> um there's no right or wrong is there it's just no, what you can definitely. do to start making things happen yeah one thing i was going to say exactly on what you said we'd said about launching a food hub so what i did was i put a post on facebook 186 people replied to it um, reference to launching a food hub. Most of those were outside the area, I have to say. 30, I think 33, 34 people said, yeah, we're interested, Mark. I stuck them all into a WhatsApp group, messaged them a week later saying, look, we're not in the position of launching the hub yet because in my head at that point, I'd got, oh, hub, big building, lots of stuff coming in, yeah. people coming to get it. And, uh, right. and then, so... I, la I launched the shop and I, I put a, a post on the WhatsApp group just saying, listen, guys, I know we've not launched the hub yet. However, we've launched this small shop on the farm and we're doing this. And the first person who came back was Charlotte. I think you spoke to the other day and she said, um, she said so you, it's a mini hub then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's exactly. It is. That's exactly what it yeah. is. And I, I think, Catherine, that if the, if the community wants to get together and, and fund something, the parish council normally have plenty of cash sitting about a thousand pound is nothing you know for a thousand pound there's probably a farmer somewhere who's got a building that could go rent free provided yeah. he gets a, a cut out of something he puts in it you know um ray who's got the farm here you know one of the things we're looking at is obviously he um produces haylage and silage bales so um it'd be right really you know, great for us to be able to just because these are in kind of mini bales and it'd be great for us just to be able to stick them outside the door and go Price on them, and he's seven pound. Let's say, put the money in the tin. People pull yeah. up when they get their horse carrots. They get to grab the bale for the horse, and away they go. And I think we've been so used to being oversold yeah. things, right? A lady came. In, I was talking to a lady on the um, WhatsApp group. She said, "So, what kind of computer system are you putting in?" Uh, so I said, "A whiteboard and a pen." She said, oh, "I've not heard of that one." <laughs> 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 I love this idea, though. I think that's fantastic. And it Quite is like communicating. All, all the prices are written on a whiteboard. Yeah. It, it's that simple. It's that basic. It's just the prices are on a whiteboard. We've got a contact emergency number on there. Should you want some change? Um, and you know, it, it's that simple. And <laughs> how think... quickly did you turn this around? When was it from conception of idea when Ray mentioned it? through to opening the door roughly how long I, was that? i think i'm right in saying it took the guys a, about a month to build the shed shop whatever you want to class it as hub um but they weren't working on it every day you know i, I suppose in reality luke would have built that in um under a week you know it's all wired right. with electricity it's got sensors in there so the lights come in and go off in accordance to people walking in and out um the cameras are going in there next week um, so yeah, I mean, within, within a week, me and Ray decorated it, um, moved the tables in, chucked some, um, fake grass on the cat on the counters and away we went. Um, Amazing. And we literally within, uh, you know, I, I, I would say it wasn't 10 days worth of work to get it up and going. And we bear in mind, we, if, if someone already had a building, they could have literally started in a day. Straight away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've got the environmental health lady coming out. Um, I sent her some pictures and said, look, this is very basic, um, but would you be happy to come out and, you know, have a look? And she said, yeah, absolutely. And she's someone I've worked with in the past on, on the fruit and veg wholesale side. And she recently came out and inspected us there. And she said, yeah, no problem at all. Should I come out? So she's out tomorrow. I'm excited about that because oh, I am going to get a five star and I know it. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking to a lady the other day who's opened a food hub. Um, on the back, funnily enough, of PHA originally. So it's right. kind of, they were looking to do a health hub, but for their ease, a food hub was a great way to start. Because she had a spare barn, 
at the back of her house. And so what they do, this is a really simple form, and this just shows where they started and where they're going to go next. So they just started off with a little group, local people, saying we're looking to do a food hub, just working with local suppliers and farmers and those that make things like candles and soaps and, you know, just locally yep. produced yep. Um, items, um, pr predominantly food. And so what they do is they don't do a lot of the super fresh stuff at the moment. Um, what they do is meat and um, some potatoes and some other bits and pieces, cakes that are locally produced, like I say, other things like candles and stuff. Yeah. And they do once a month. So they put in a big order. Everyone gets ready. They run around the week before a couple of volunteers gather everything together. But what's lovely is on that Sunday, it's usually a Sunday when everyone's going to come and pick up their boxes of whatever they're doing. Someone makes a cake, someone puts the kettle on, someone gets the chairs out and they all sit around and they have a natter and they talk together about how they move on. So they're Absolutely. currently looking for, because it's only a little tiny barn. So they're currently looking for a bigger um, a, a bigger uh, building so that they can do this then weekly um, or even more frequently uh, because they've now got all of their, if you like, I'm going to call it constitution, but they've got their um, arrangements set up now. They've seen what works, what doesn't work so well, how to best communicate. But they've got people coming on a 40 mile journey out of the principle of it to go there and take part in that. And I mean, they got it sounds like they've got some beautiful organic meat and they have to level it up with the farmer for when it's going to be available and stuff. So that's why it's kind of monthly. But they are looking to, to, to do it more frequently because they love it. And I love the concept of at least once a month, having that tea and cake and sitting around, yeah. having a natter, getting to know your people locally, sharing ideas. Um, you know, she said some of the best ideas have come off the back of those just sat around and have a cuppa and a chat. Um, yeah. And they're looking to expand that now. And that just started off in her tiny little barn, just a once a month thing. And they now want to do it as a weekly, if not more frequently thing. Um, and I love that idea. I love that concept. And I love the fact that they come together for these cuppas. And that's where the magic happens, as it were. Yeah, yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, on Saturday, for instance, we had, there was one point I'd got, um, Andrew, I think Andrew's surname's Morgan, I don't know if you, he's the guy who was on Richard Vogue's show talking about the legalities of owning, of changing who the council is um, around your farm. So you make yourself the council rather than the authority. So you make yourself the right. authority rather than the council the authority um, on the um, deeds to the farm. So... I, he was. He came down, he drove down from Attleborough, which must be a good 35, 40 miles from me, with his wife. We, we stood there talking, they'd done some shopping, we'd wandered around the farm, they went in to do some shopping, they were in there, another couple pulled up, elderly couple, they stood and cooed, because it's only a tiny shop, obviously, they cooed to get in. By that point, there was another lady pulled up, a man and woman came walking up the farm drive, Um, because they were out walking the dog, they were going to get some bits, then another lady pulled up, and everyone stood there, when, it, when everyone had finished shopping they were still all talking and i thought yeah that is what this is about this is like when yeah. people used to go to the pub on a sunday morning you know or sunday afternoon rather church on a sunday morning and you would be in that you could just stand and have a chat with them no one comes out the house anymore Catherine. everyone's yeah, on the bloody phones doing this or ipads whatever chuck all the technology away you know you don't need big computer systems for this you just need a tin to put the cash in Keep cash alive is, is important, you know, yeah. and people need to just understand this can be as basic as you want to make it. And that is the key to this, because that's what the supermarkets can't do. They can't yeah. bring it down to the same level that we can get people to play at. They have to have now. Um, I, I don't know if you've listened to um, Roland Rapp was on the TV this morning. You know, Rishi Shunak gets <laughs> on there this morning. Um talking about shopkeepers being abused and it's a terrible thing how shopkeepers have been abused over the last year and as a direct result of that what we need to do is put facial recognition in every shop oh. isn't that Funny interesting that. i wondered mm. how they'd sell it <laughs> yeah yeah we've all been waiting to see what their angle would be haven't we so that's how they're doing it um you know it's all these shopkeepers better terrible how many shopkeepers get abused and, and i'm sure they do don't get me wrong you yeah know, um but enough to warrant cameras at every turn of this you know aisle i don't think so um and let's face it Catherine. you know yourself you walk in a supermarket you go in for a loaf of bread and you come out with 40 quid's worth of shopping guy said to me the other day the guy who rang me about the cash in the tin he said you know what was nice he said i went in for a pint of milk he said that's all i came out with yeah yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, I said, it's well, true. <laughs> what else did you think you were going to come out of? He said, well, nothing. He said, but if I go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's, it costs me £30 to buy a pint of milk. <laughs> it is true. It is. Because it's almost like, oh, I can't bother to come back here soon. I might as well grab a few extra bits that you don't necessarily need, but you're just trying to save yourself hassle. Yeah. If it's, a, you know, ideally a mile or so up the road, your little local hub, food hub or, or food shop, whatever you want to have. Um, God, how easy is that? And then also as well with the box scheme, what I like about that is you know what you're getting, you know what you've ordered, you can plan in advance what you're going to have so you don't have wastage because I don't like wastage. And um, you get what you need. And if I'm not going to a shop, I'm not tempted to buy anything else. Yeah. I'm getting it. That's what I've organised. That's what I'm yeah. having. So you ultimately, even Plenty if meals. the price point possibly is slightly higher than the supermarket, which occasionally it might well be, but now you you're going to save money on quid. fuel and extra yeah. bits and time. And oh, my goodness me. And you have the added bonus of getting to meet actually people who could well be on your wavelengths and you could have some really wonderful conversations with, you know, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so what I'd say to people out there before we tie up is don't be put off about the idea of building a hub, thinking it has to be some extravagant, huge, magnificent project. You can really do something, a thousand pounds. Okay. It's a lot of money to a lot of us, but at the same time, if a community comes together, that's not a, 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 a you know, in some amount of amount of money to get a basic hub open. And it can be as tiny as the one Mark's described. And still you're going to gather the community together. Still, you're going to have an impact. Yeah. Still, you're going to save money and still you're going to get locally produced food out in, into the community. Um, and as people do grow more, I know the weather's against us now, but as people do grow more, if you're a grower and you've got a glut, no one wants to see that wasted. So take it to your local hub and it can be distributed out to people. It can be sold for money, the hub to make Absolutely. some money. Or you could use it in a food bank styley for those in your community who aren't able to go and buy that sort of produce for themselves. So there is yeah. so many positive connotations attached to doing this and not just the practical food side, but what you can do for your community when you come together. I'm just so excited, Mark, that you've just shown how quick and easy and yeah, I think, I mean, be. Catherine, one of the other things which um we're going to put together in the village, and this is one of the things which I'm going to speak to the um sort of kind of community about it in the next few weeks, is obviously volunteering on the farm to grow the produce, to get people together again. And another thing which we're looking at is going to be, and we did this in um, in the villages where our other farm was, is the called Produce in the Porch. So this is where yeah. stuff was overgrown, um, as in overproduced on any of the farms that they want to donate. That's put in the church porchways for families who are struggling. Because Catherine and I always talk about this, but for my side, when I was when my wife and I years ago separated and the kids come to live with me, and I was really struggling financially and was reliant on food bank um, parcels, and you know, <laughs> and that kills me to admit that I have to say. But the one thing I missed in it was fresh produce because it was all tins and packets, yeah. and we lived on it. It got us out of trouble, and I appreciate wholeheartedly that however the one thing that was missing was my kids were brought up on loads of fruit and veg and that was missing so this is one of the things which i think the communities want to start working on again is getting people that food into people's houses you know there's plenty of villages that have got allotments that are not used there's plenty of villages that have got allotments that overproduce and people don't know what to do with the stuff they don't pick it because it, you know we've got no use for it give it away yeah you know Every time you give something away what's worth a pound, it's a pound the system doesn't take. Yeah. And every and pound... And you can really impact people's them, lives. Absolutely. Yeah, every time we take a pound away from the system is brilliant. And the yeah. impact on the people's lives that you're helping, you know, Catherine, it, do, it's, it doesn't take a chef to be able to do a stir fry, you know, yeah. for the sake of, you know, if you've got courgettes and carrots and different things, what you can scrabble together off an allotment, you can easily make stir fry. I'm no cook. You know, when my kids came to live with me, I struggled because I could barely do a fry up. And that was about it. I had a friend who was a chef who used to come around and give me cooking lessons. Uh, Good for and, you. You know, I, I, was, I was the husband who went to work and earned the money and my wife stopped me at the front door and said, you sit there. Do you want a cup of tea? She never, ever once asked me to go in the kitchen. I never once did. Um, and then, you know, and then when we separated, I was like, <laughs> now what do we do? Um, <laughs> so 
I, I think I think it's important that people start to get back to real cooking as yeah. well. This is, you know, I was with a teacher yesterday. She actually came out to interview me. Um, lovely lady from Cambridge. And she's a supply teacher. And she was saying that, you know, the kids, you know, she's about our age. And she said the kids need to get back to being taught growing food at school. They need to get back to cooking at school. And, you know, so they start to understand again what food is and where it comes from. And that's what I see these um, community hubs as being a part of. Yeah. You know, we've got the pharmacy side. We know, yeah. you know, the you know the health hubs, the food hubs, the food, um, the you know, whether you call it, whether it's a village shop or a farm shop, whatever you want to call it, all of these things roll into this, um, yeah. and roll into that cash as well, and then or yeah. even your own currency as to speak. You know, whether that's everyone pays in silver or everyone pays in promissory notes. Hey, it works for the Bank of England, giving everyone promissory <laughs> notes. Why can't we do it? I promise I'll come and wash your windows. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> this there is this is the nice part solution. of it, though, because for those people who may be on a low income, for example, and um, they might struggle to afford enough food through one of these hubs initially for their families, what they can always do potentially, and I'm just throwing this out there as, a, as a, an idea, is it is a barter situation. So everyone's got a skill set. Everyone's got something they can do. You can offer your skills, your services, your time, your energy in exchange for maybe some extra produce or something else. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's the beauty of it. You take the government out. You take the banks out. You take all of the centralized control systems out of this um, localized production and sharing and caring kind of um, project. And all of a sudden they become irrelevant. They're irrelevant. They're not relevant anymore. We're going to do it our way and we're going to do it for each other. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. And it, there is no, this is the point I think we're trying to get across today, isn't it, Mark? There's no set rules. There's no set, no. you have to do this a certain way. It is in, in the image of what you and your community want it to be. And we just Absolutely. wanted to show an example of what Mark's done and how simplistic and basic you can do something as a starting point. And then you can grow from there. But you're doing something. You're making a start. And people will come. They will come. And as you gather more people, you can then think, hang on a minute. We've got 50, 60 people here who want to create a food hub. What? Yeah. Let's get our heads together. What can we do? And all of a sudden, you can then start creating that bigger project. You can start looking at the bigger picture. You can start bringing all the other elements in. And it's not you know, a, a massive challenge because you're not on your own anymore. In your little shop sounds like a great hub for people to come together and start building those connections. Well, Catherine, one of the things I'm going to do this week is I'm going to put a sign in the shop saying register on our WhatsApp group to know about special offers. So then as we get, I don't know, you know, if we get a new delivery of honey coming, for instance, yeah. um, we can WhatsApp the group and say honey's now available. Um, and I think that the WhatsApp and, and things like that are so powerful. You know, yeah. they're, they're things now what we rely on so much. And I have, have to say in all of this, the importance is just do something. Yeah. Just do, yeah. just get on with doing something. We, we've proved, you know, I'm, I'm no an expert in anything. You know, I talk a lot, but I'm no expert. <laughs> but what I do know is had I've done nothing about this, nothing yeah. would have happened. All the people in the village now that are getting excited and supporting it, they're coming out to see us, you know, and, and tell us about what they want. That is exciting. And that um, energy yeah. will you know, transfer into other things, you know, locally as well, whether that's, yeah. you know, getting the community to come to, together for growing days or whatever else. One thing I was going to say, Catherine, as well, um, here in the village, we have um, a lady and gentleman, which I kind of, they used to come and stand at my other farm shop. They've got a little um, business which does refills. So they come with the big tanks of like shampoo and all nice stuff, you know, none of this chemical stuff. And they rock up and you take your empty shampoo bottle and fill up and so forth. Brilliant. And they come to the village. So I'm going to speak to them and see if they want to come and stand at the farm shop um, on one day, you know, a month or something for people to be able to bring their empty bottles Amazing. and containers and just fill up while they're there. And, uh, you know, and they sell all nice smellies and um, bath bombs and things what are uh, nicely made. So I think, and there's got to be other people like that. And I mean, a lady contacted yeah. me yesterday. She makes some um, knitted... Um, Knitted something, hats and scarves and gloves and things, you know, knitted things. Crochet, that's the word I'm looking for. Crochet, not crochet, knitted. Crochet, there we go. 
Uh, and yeah, crocheted and knitted. And you know, would I be able to put them in there? Yeah, absolutely, that's what it's for. That's what it's for. It's for the community who make things and do things locally to bring all this stuff together and absolutely. have it as a, you know, as a, as a, like, you know, a market stall for everybody's produce. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, and it's just so simple. The great thing with a WhatsApp group is if I put anything new in there, bang, it's there, it's done. Yeah. Everyone's seen it on the group, you know. And if you've got, you know, I, mean, I don't know how many people live in the f- vicinities of here, but you know, a good few thousand in the local villages, um, you know, get all that lot on a WhatsApp group and you've got a powerful tool, yeah. It's and there powerful. goes, you know, where's your marketing budget? Oh, we don't need one. We use WhatsApp and we talk, you know, and word of mouth. I used to be in advertising flipping 20, 30 years ago. And even then, and still to this day, as far as I'm concerned, the best form of advertising is word of mouth. Absolutely. And it will spread and people will hear about it and they will share with each other. And you'll just watch it grow and grow. And then it'll reach to a point where you're probably going to outgrow the shed. And you'll then think, OK, it's time to move on. It's time to look at something else. Or maybe the shed just can stay there and it just expands into something else. You just don't know. But that's the beauty of it. It will be what it will be. Yeah. I mean, like those caravans, what you get where the sides pull out. and Yeah. Yeah. That's the ones. Yeah. <laughs> but I hope everyone who's watching this today has got some inspiration from this and can, can realise that, A, the most important thing you can do is do something. B, a hub, a food hub, doesn't have to be a massive project to start with. Start with something small. As I always like to say, y- use what you've got. You know, do what you can yep. with what you've got and get on with it. Because that is all we can do at the moment. And things will grow and expand. And number three, we understand it's difficult to grow in the current climate, but would encourage everyone, whether you're in a community growing group, whether you've got an allotment, whether it's your back garden, whether it's your windowsill, get growing as much as you possibly can, because we're all going to need access to healthy, you know, nutritious food this year. There are going to be food shortages. The sooner that all of us start growing means that we can take care of everybody else as well. Well, Like they say, don't just put your fences higher grow your make your table longer you know we are all in this together particularly at community level and we've got to look out for each other because the government won't the supermarkets won't no one else is going to do it it is down to we the people so thank you so much today mark for your time my friend much much appreciated the one thing you need to add to that number four is take this away from them put the power back into our hands and take it away from them yeah absolutely absolutely my friend absolutely um but don't be limited by what you think that the boundaries are there are not boundaries apart from being decent human being there are no boundaries just go out there and make it happen thank you so much guys for watching um do like subscribe share all that good stuff that i'm supposed to say at the end of each video and frequently forget and i'll be back soon with another guy who's going to be uh talking with us about how to take your business your small or medium-sized enterprise from this more 3D way of thinking, which is just profit driven into something that will actually benefit the community around you is focused on the people and yet will still um, create a profitable enterprise. So more of that to come next week. Thank you so much. And we'll speak again soon.